Uh, today I'm going to talk to you about our approach to full stack, full stack testing um, at Ladder. So a little about myself. Um, I was an engineer at Mailbox and Dropbox for a couple years. Um, worked up and down the stack, um, did some back end things and worked on um, systems of, of scale, which was fun. Um, I also got to later on work uh, on the front end doing some full stack engineering. Um, and yeah, I basically have some scars from doing single page development in React um, in immutable language and uh, sort of during that time discovered Closure Script and uh, sort of fell in love with uh, the sort of built in approach to immutability and pure functions. Um, and uh, when we started Ladder, uh, kind of took that took that knowledge with me. Um, yeah, so now now at Ladder, um, we're building a new type of life insurance company. Um, sort of a lot of these companies have been around for a long time, and so we're building a new company that's all digital and um, sort of powered by software from the ground up. Um, so. It's like one of the big things we're working on is using, using data to underwrite people in real time. Um, so traditionally the process can take up to four to six weeks um, and we want to be able to get people in, get them policies um, sort of in five minutes. Um, and the other piece is sort of we're building a you know interactive client component and so we want to help people we want to empower our users, give them tools to visualize and manipulate complex financial data and really understand how their insurance needs um, change over time. Um, so that's sort of like the, the general types of problems that we're working on. Um, and we're really early stage. We're 10 people right now, four engineers. Um, we're iterating a lot on the user experience. So um, our stage is one where we want to iterate really quickly. We want to have a lot of flexibility. Um, and yeah, but we're also big proponents of testing. And uh, we have a core belief that sort of like the right type of testing um, can accelerate this type of development. Um, whereas sort of testing at the wrong layers or over testing could slow us down. So we're trying to find sort of a sweet spot um, that works for us. So here's our uh, crisp problem statement, um, we're looking for a test solution um, that is decoupled. Um, so something that um, is not tied to our current implementation, um, ideally something that sort of picks sort of an API boundary and respects that. Um, and what this will let us do is give us flexibility to, you know, protect potentially like refactor implementations um, without breaking our tests. And better than that, sort of our tests giving us sort of really good feedback on whether or not, you know, our factoring worked. Um, so sort of nailing this will like give us a ton of flexibility. Um, yeah, we want, similar to decoupled, we want these tests to be end to end. So we want sort of the scope of what these tests are testing to be as broad as possible. Um, lightweight, uh, we want these tests to run fast. Um, we don't want, we want to avoid sort of lots of dependencies, um, setup, overhead, um, inter-process communication. So something that is quick, um, quick to run in CI and also just quick to, to run development. Um, and then finally, we want them to be simple. So a simple interface um, for developers to, to write and debug tests. So these are our criteria. Um, first, let's kind of dive into common approaches to testing. Um, so these are sort of testing approaches that I've used um, at other places. And, um, and these are all sort of like, these are important approaches to testing, but just sort of general, the general category. So if this is sort of your, your general um, client server application, um, you know, your client could be sort of like a single page app, a mobile client, um, and you know, your networking layer is sort of translating um, things that you're hearing over the network into sort of um, intense, whatever that means in your application, and you know, calling into some library functions. So, 
Um, unit tests is, you know, you're just sort of taking, taking various functions that you want to understand better and you're providing sort of input-output pairs and um, sort of like you're just asserting internal functions are working correctly. So these are super lightweight, fast, um, but they're totally coupled to your implementation in that you know, these are sort of scattered through all the different layers of your software and, you know, they're obviously not end-to-end -end and that was never their intention. So, um, so that's uh, unit tests. And then you can kind of look at API tests. You could also call these network tests. Um, the idea is like you would spin up your server and you would sort of hit your, your network API. Um, these are simple in that there's sort of like one consistent interface, which, you know, if you have sort of you're defining like a REST HTTP server. Um, so sort of your inputs, you're just asserting things about inputs and outputs from HTTP requests. Um, but from the perspective of a client, and sort of in our case, we wanna be really testing um, client and server together and in sort of sufficiently complex mobile and single page apps, it's really sort of the orchestration of the two that's important. So from the perspective of a client, sort of the network API is um, sort of implementation detail. So this is not sort of as end-to-end -end as we want to be. Um, sort of the last category is UI automation tests. And so a lot of you are probably familiar with Selenium. Um, and this is great and it's sort of very decoupled from your implementation. So, I mean, you could think about, like you could switch from having a Python backend and like an Angular JS front end and then you could swap to, you know, be using Clojure and Ohm. Um, and as long as sort of you have the same buttons with the same class names or, you know, you could probably get, in theory, you could have your Selenium tests sort of work against that. So that's a really nice property um, is that they're sort of agnostic to your implementation um, and they're end-to-end. -end. They're testing everything, but sort of they don't score as well as being lightweight and simple. Um, sort of these tests sort of have complicated interfaces. They're also like not cross-platform. So, you know, web, Android, iOS all have sort of different um, UI automation frameworks. Um, and these are just, you know, these are slow because these are fundamentally, um, you know, automating what a browser would do. Um, so this is sort of not sort of the, the sweet spot of what we're looking for. Um, in a lot of, you know, a lot of cases you'll have sort of all three of these. Um, so yeah, let's look at what happens when you would try to refactor. So let's say you sort of wanted to sort of like rework things. You know, you're gonna break some unit tests. Um, also sort of if you change, you know, how your client's calling your server, you're gonna have broken API layer tests. Um, also, you know, the spec changes. Um, every time you change the spec, you're gonna break test um, because your, your, your test spec is typically, you know, asserting some sort of behavior change. So, um, but what we're trying to look for is a solution that like mitigates um, all, the, all the different, you know, potentially expensive like work that you're gonna have to put in um, fixing all your Selenium tests. So let's keep looking. Um, so Ohm Next, um, Ohm Next is a um, uniform yet extensible approach to building um, networked uh, interactive applications. Um, it's written in ClojureScript. Um, it's a wrapper for React. Um, and the thing that's great about React is it gives you functional rendering for web, iOS, Android. Um, and Ohm Next was inspired by um, Relay, GraphQL, Falcor, and Datomic. Um, also, a side note on that is um, Tony K is doing a unsession tonight on uh, Untangled, which is a framework on top of Ohm Next. So uh, check that check that out. I think it might be next door tonight. Um, also, another great way to learn about Ohm Next is uh, David Nolan has some really great talks, um, basically some good intro talks and some more in-depth ones. So um, so we're using Ohm Next. Um, this is what an Ohm Next DAC looks like, and um, sort of the first thing that and this is sort of our Ohm, stack, Ohm Next stack in that Ohm Next is not prescriptive about sort of what your server looks like, but uh, this is sort of how ours is structured. And um, yeah, the first thing that kind of should jump out at you is that the client parser um, is sort of split out from sort of UI 
and networking. So sort of you're, you're splitting out sort of your pure data layer um, business logic from UI and networking. Um, and we're gonna see that sort of that arch architectural decision in Ohm Next is really gonna let us do some cool stuff with testing. Um, so walking through the responsibilities of the, the different components in an Ohm Next app. So you have your UI, this is just a bunch of sort of dumb React components that um, define a query, take data, and render data. Um, and so the top, you know, they just take, React's really good at rendering trees. Um, and so they define a query. Um, the other thing they do is, that's sort of like the read render side. Um, you also want your user interface to be interactive and sort of propagate information back up. So React is great of having a functional way to bind to event listeners. Um, if you've ever sort of managed a, a lifecycle uh, manually, you'll probably end up with, you know, sort of memory leaks and sort of, um, you know, lost callback functions. React handles that in a really great way. Um, and so, so when you get interaction from the, the client, you want to send mutations to the, to the client parser. And another cool decision that Ohm made is uh, uses a command model. So instead of the UI directly invoking sort of some function on the, the client parser, it just hands over sort of some reified data, um, which is, you know, an intent rather than an implementation. Um, and that sort of layer of indirection will let us do some, some cool stuff with testing. So client parser, as I said, is the pure business logic layer. It services reads from the client. Um, and also, you know, if it can't satisfy some of these reads, it'll send it to the server. Um, and also applies optimistic mutations. So um, if a user interacts with your site, sort of you want to show them a result of that um, sort of interaction immediately. And that's really the whole point of, you know, re like rich, rich interactive client applications. And if that's not a requirement for you, then you really shouldn't be using Ohm Next or any sort of single page app framework because there's a huge cost in sort of getting, getting sort of like a, a reactive experience without having to go to the server. Um, client networking layer, this is just, you know, it takes basically a query from the parser and just sends it to the server. Um, and this is sort of where asynchrony can live in your, in your frame, or this, this layer. Um, and the, the other cool thing about Ohm Next is that there is sort of no visible asynchrony within your, your business logic or your UI. Um, and for people that have done lots of like JavaScript front end development, um, it's easy to get sort of in callback hell and sort of with like racing, you know, concurrent XHR requests. Um, and Ohm Next has really good batching. So it'll sort of just aggregate all the, the need from your whole client and hand it to this networking layer. Um, and so every time you go over the wire, you're sort of getting everything you need. Um, and so we just have like sort of a, a one at a time networking paradigm where um, we just say, you know, we're not gonna have concurrent network requests. We're just gonna play them one at a time, um, which is, you know, a trade off. We, we lose some theoretical performance, but it's a lot, a lot simpler. Um, cool, and then the networking layer is basically translating sort of bytes you're getting over the network um, into, um, basically a query that you send to the server parser. And then the server parser is sort of your, your logical API. And this is the thing that's writing to the database, sending emails, conducting all your server side business logic, and also um, servicing reads. So that's sort of a overview of the stack. So our approach, our claim is that um, testing client parser to server parser, um, you can see this is all in the JVM, um, is going to be a good testing approach um, that gives us nice, lightweight, simple, decoupled testing that is end-to-end-ish. <laughs> so, cool. So let's do a quick whirlwind tour of Ohm Next um, through an example. Um, let's say we're gonna build a social networking app. So we're gonna have um, friends um, and we're just gonna display all the users and then each user we're gonna display their friends. The only thing you can do in this is you can add a friend. Um, there's no authentication or a sense of like the current user. Um, and this is basically just a server side extension of applying property based testing to uh, user interfaces. So the people in our network are Bob, Mary, and Laura. Um, Bob and Mary are friends. That's it. That's really, really simple. Um, so if we're going to, you know, first step, let's just build some React components. Um, 
you know, we have people as our top level component. Um, each, you know, we're gonna render all the, um, like the, the person components underneath them. Each person component has a name and some friends. Um, and then each friend just has a name. So these are components that, that say like, give me data and I'll just render um, to the DOM. Um, and then React kind of takes care of like flushing that actually to the, to the browser. Um, and so yeah, where do, we, where do we get the data? Um, so Ohm's answer to this question is just uh, having components declaratively um, say what, what data they require. Um, and so you can see these, these queries sort of are one-to-one -one with props. Um, and so if we ask the root component people, like what data do you need? It's pulling the data that you know, all of its children need and sort of recursively down the line. So before mounting all this, we can just say, hey, what's, what's the data requirement of the UI? And we get this nice query. Um, and so we can take this query and then pass it to our client parser and our client parser will sort of hydrate our query. So it'll give us data, the exact data in the same shape that we requested. Um, and so, you know, hydrated query would look like this. So if you kind of, <laughs> uh, you gotta see that they correspond in shape. Um, and this is gonna be the main interface that we're gonna test that is we're going to um, sort of we're gonna send, send the parser mutations. Those mutations are gonna sort of propagate through our whole system, um, come back, and then we're gonna query the, the state of the UI. Um, and we'll get the query of the UI sort of when it's in the optimistic state as well as in the final state. Um, so the cool thing about this hydrated query, we, we should, we'll call this the, the UI data tree. Um, and the nice thing, the nice kind of guarantee um, that Ohm gives us is that our DOM is just a simple function of this UI data tree. Um, so we can feel really comfortable sort of, if we know the shape of the UI data tree, that a DOM is gonna look just like that. Uh, it's gonna have at least the same data. Um, cool, so let's, let's go sort of get back to our claim. So um, first, let's look into simple. So we want tests to be really easy to write and debug. Um, I think we all know that if, uh, tests are really a pain to write, then they're gonna be a lot less tests written. Um, so sort of like the simpler and easier they can be to write, um, the better test that our application is gonna be. So this, is re this really matters. Um, so as I said before, you know, we're gonna, we have our UI query, we populate that into a UI data tree, um, and then the UI says, I wanna add a friend. Um, and this is sort of gonna change the state of our system, so we'll go from sort of state A to state B. Um, and then we requery our system again with a UI data tree, or with a query, and that gives us a new UI data tree. So we can see in the one below, you know, Bob's friends with Mary. Um, and so that's what our tests are gonna do. Our tests are gonna sort of supply some sequence of these mutations and various um, parameters of these mutations. Um, and then we're just gonna make assertions about what is the actual shape of the UI data tree. Um, the other thing, this is, you know, we're full stack testing here, and so, um, and the kind of API we want to maintain is that um, we want to sort of like be at like a user perspective. Um, so we want to only look at the UI data tree and we only want to look at sort of other things that we would see. So a user would see, you know, push notifications or emails. Um, so we mock out um, our SMTP client and um, we can assert if we, you know, person one, friends, person two, and person two, friends, person three, we want to make sure person like persons two and three both get emails. Um, so these tests should be really easy to write too. Um, cool, so basically our mutation sequences, um, you know, we're using the command pattern. So um, client intent is reify data. It's just simple closure data. This is just a seek where the first, uh, you know, the first element is a symbol, um, the second is a map. Um, and we also, our UI data trees are simple data. And so we can navigate those and make assertions about those. Um, that's sort of like what, why we all started like programming in Clojure because we just love sort of being able to like look at data and play with it and sort of like make assertions about it. And um, so this is something that you can, these are the types of tests that we can write now. So simple, check. Um, decoupled, so are these not tied to the current implementation? Um, as we just saw, 
we're only making assertions about our UI data tree in sort of out of band things like uh, what emails we got or we, other API calls that we'd mock out. Um, so everything else can change. Um, uh, we can't change the fact that we're using OM next though. That's, that's sort of one of the, because we are making all of our assertions against the UI data tree. Um, but you know, we can change sort of how we're representing state on the client, or we can sort of choose to not persist some, like, uh, you know, reify some things on the client, or we can move things from the client to the server. We could change our database schema. Um, we could change the way we're serializing things, um, or, you know, sort of the way our endpoints work. Um, so we can move lots of sort of API boundaries around, um, but as long as we're delivering sort of the same UI data tree, which is the thing that the end user ultimately sees. Um, we're gonna have tests that are robust to refactoring. Um, cool, another question is, since we're only looking at the UI data tree, um, how do we know that our server is actually persisting our changes? Um, because, you know, like just doing local development, you can sort of like click around through your app um, and if it's sort of doing all the good optimistic things, um, it's showing you the right thing, but then when you refresh the page, like none of the data's there. And you're like, well, uh, okay, I screwed something up. Um, so we wanna be able to write tests that do that. Um, and sort of the naive approach of doing this would be you would issue some client mutation, and then you would just look in the database and you'd sort of assert that there's that friendship in there. Um, and so that's one way to do it, um, but the problem with that is now you're sort of coupling your tests to the, you know, to the database you're using to the current representation of that state in the database. Um, let's say you sort of do a big migration and you sort of want to change how you're, how you're storing and change it. You shouldn't break um, these tests for that. So sort of the decoupled approach is, you know, the client will mutate, um, and then you simulate a page refresh, and the way you do that is, um, Basically, the semantic guarantee of Ohm is that you can read at any time. Um, so sort of at the end of um, our sort of state transition, like our, so the state transition is we'll, we'll go from a start state, um, we'll apply this add friend mutation, we'll go to an optimistic state, um, and then we'll get a response back from the server and we'll go to the final state. Um, and then after that, we will sort of just query the server with an empty client state, um, and that'll give us like the same effect as if we refresh the page. Um, and so we can just compare that refresh UI data tree to our final state UI data tree. Um, and that's the same as you know refreshing the page, and so we can not only test that it was written in our database, but that we can also fetch it and turn it, transform it into a client query. So that's, that's sort of an example um, of how we get decoupling through this approach. Um, end to end, so we wanna test as much as possible. Um, so from this, we saw a slide earlier, um, you know, we're not testing the networking layer, the client networking layer, or the UI. Um, that's sort of the bad news, but the good news is in these, like these layers should be really simple and um, are really not part of sort of the, the, the chain, like the business logic of your application. Um, and so, we're pretty cognizant to keep sort of our networking layer doesn't have sort of tons of, you know, um, sort of like different cases. There's sort of just one case of just like sending things to the server. Um, and the other thing is the sort of the UI, as we saw earlier, is just a lot of React components and um, it's just functionally taking a UI data tree and rendering it to the DOM. Um, and this. And so sort of the, so the downside is there's pieces that we're not testing, um, and that's a, the drawback, but the, what we're getting out of this is we're gonna test the core data flow, um, and so we'll be omitting some boundary nodes, but what the purpose of this type of testing is to sort of give us confidence that, um, you know, when we, when we go to start, after we write some of these tests and we go start QAing, we're not QAing like, whether or not um, like the data has been sent to the server and like is correct on the client. Like we're not QAing like do we have stale entries or not. All we're QAing is like is this rendering right? Is the CSS correct? Do I, does that animation look well? Um, so sort of 
for the hard parts of our application, which is sort of moving data around, um, we're gonna lock that down and we're gonna be able to reason about it really well. Um, and then this approach is sort of gonna not test things like given some closure map, can we send, you know, with to from subject, can we send an email? Um, these are other things that we can write unit tests for. Cool, so end to end does not get a check, but is uh, also not an X, so um, lightweight. So we wanna test um, is our approach, yeah, we want our approach to be fast with little dependency setup and overhead. Um, so let's think about like what we're doing. Um, this is all running on the JVM. Um, the cool thing about the client parser is that it's just the data layer. It's just your data business logic. It's all, it's like answering queries from the UI um, and sort of giving it back UI data trees and it's taking in, like novelty and mutations and sort of changing state. Um, none of that is sort of, it should be totally DOM agnostic. Um, so with the reader conditional, we can just run this um, on the JVM. Um, and so that's great, so for lightweight, so we only, we're only in one process. Um, and the other cool thing, sort of an aside there, is this logic, your client parser should be totally portable, um, so you should be able to drop this in on any other client. Um, so you could run this in React Native on iOS. Um, you would sort of have a totally different UI layer, um, but this is sort of the, the modularity guarantee of Omnex, where we can just swap out UIs, and those UIs will have their own queries but they'll instantly sort of have access to all the mutations that we implemented on our other client. Um, they'll be able to read the same data, but this, the shape of the UI data tree will, will change. Um, so cool, so everything's JVM one, one process. There's no rendering. All we're doing is like outputting a UI data tree, um, which is just a bunch of maps and vectors and keywords. Um, there's no network IO. Um, we're using an in-memory database. Um, so everybody gets their own test database so we can run all these tests in parallel. Um, cool, so let's, yeah, so let's, also let's, we'll do a little demo. So this is our drive function. Um, we're just gonna call friend add um, a thousand times. And every time we call friend add, what we're doing is, oh, you guys see that okay? Anyways, we're, we're calling, uh, we're just gonna call a mutation um, in the REPL. Um, and yeah, so basically you can see here it runs in 600 milliseconds. So what we did is sort of we added a friend and every time we add a friend, we mutate our client state, we reparse out an optimistic UI data tree um, we send that mutation to the server, um, we write it to the database, we call send email on our email um, protocol. Um, the server, then we service any reads that we have, we send those reads back to the client, um, we merge those into the client state, and then we re-query the final state to get the final UI data tree. Um, and then we do sort of the whole refresh, re refresh flow, and that happens sort of each time um, for every sort of mutation in uh, friend add. Um, so it's pretty cool that we can do that in 600 milliseconds. Um, so you wouldn't be able to do that with, with uh, Selenium or other sort of testing, UI automation testing approaches. So lightweight, check. Um, cool, and now that we can sort of run these arbitrary sequences of um, sort of user interaction, um, we can do property-based testing. Um, so quick overview of property-based testing is um, like sort of compared to example-based testing is an example-based testing, you know, you put on your adversarial hat and you're like, how can I break this code? And like you try to give sort of tricky input-output pairs and make sure that your function is doing the right thing. Um, so that's sort of like what most of us think of when we think of testing uh, as example-based testing. Um, property-based testing is we just generate random input um, and then we sort of run it through our system and then we insert some invariance hold. Um, and so it's kind of tough to write these invariants because they're more general, um, but yeah, we can sort of, like this is similar to like fuzzing um, where you just sort of like blast things with input and see if they break. Um, so that's the, that's the same, that's the sort of the, the general idea behind property-based testing. Um, so here's an example. 
uh, what we have is, let's say we wanted to test that closures, um, like closure core sort is idempotent. Um, what we do is we generate, you know, vectors of random size with the, where the entries are random integers, um, and then we would sort it, and then we would sort it twice, and then we compare those results. And if those results are equal, um, you know, then we can feel, it's not a proof, but we can feel pretty confident that um, this property of item potency of sorting um, sort of holds true for this sort, sort implementation. Um, so in our social, social friends app, um, these are some of the invariants that we want to hold. So, um, yeah, in particular, we're going to look into, we don't want to send repeat emails. So we want to sort of gain confidence that our system, like if someone just is like, click, 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 friend, 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 it's not going to like blow your inbox up with, you know, a ton of email notifications. Um, so we want to assert sort of one email notification per friending. Um, and then the other thing we want to do is we want to assert um, that our, our client is synced given any sequence of input. Um, and the way we'll assert synced is sort of what we are talking about before by comparing our refresh tree to our final tree. Um, so you guys are not able to see that very well. Changing fonts on the fly here. That was, that was unsuccessful. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, so let's go to our, our property-based testing. So up at the top here, we sort of have um, sort of our generator. So this is going to generate a bunch of sequences of friend adding. Um, and um, yeah, and so like if we run that in the REPL, we get you know, something that looks like, like this. So sort of sequences of, of friends, friend adding. Um, so like this one, this will give us like the empty set. This will you know, have person two, friend, person one. Um, but it just gives us sort of like a random string of data. And so from our sorting example, this is you know, the, the input for our vector, just like random, random entries. Um, and then we're going to run these e examples through our, our synced code. Um, and this, you know, our property synced, all it's going to do is it's going to, um, you know, we're going to assert that um, sort of the, the final tree is equal to the refresh tree. Um, so we'll run that. Cool. And so we get a failure. Um, and the cool thing is it'll shrink our input down to the middle middle failing case, um, and which is, you know, turns into a nice property-based test um, or example-based test. So we can just call drive on this. Um, yeah, and so that, that gives us our UI data tree. And so synced, we're comparing uh, that our final tree is equal to our refresh tree. Um, and so if we look at these two, uh, we can see sort of in the refresh tree that Mary is sort of Bob is friends with Mary, but Mary's not friends with Bob. Um, so it looks like we're not persisting the reciprocal relationship, but we are in the client. So we can go ahead and fix this. Little live fixing things in production here. Then we go back to our test. Um, cool, and we can see that we fixed the we fixed the property based test passes, um, and then now our example um, we've have a reciprocal uh, we've persisted that reciprocal relationship on the server. Um, so same sort of thing for for email. 
Um, but yeah, the cool thing is that you know, for all the different friending inputs, we now feel really comfortable that if we hit refresh at any point in time, we would see the same data. Cool, so that was just a little example of property-based testing. So, Rich Hickey quote, not everything is awesome. Um, so we look at sort of the trade-offs. So the cons, as we saw, um, you know, this approach isn't fully end-to-end. -end. Um, another thing we ran into is there's some running the client parser on the JVM. There's some sort of JS, JVM discrepancies. Um, sort of, there's, there's only like the number type in JavaScript, whereas there's sort of a lot of different types of numbers in the, on the JVM. And so one thing that we've, among other things, um, we found is we put a lot of our shared code um, to get tested, same, they run the same tests um, in the JVM and in JavaScript. Um, so that's sort of one way to mitigate that, that con. But the pro is we have a framework that we can run tons of tests super quickly, um, and it's really lightweight. Um, and it gives us a ton of confidence about our data. Um, it gives us sort of, if we sort of think of the whole scope of our application, it gives us like this core piece, which is the data, um, the data moving between client and server. And we can get really confident about that, and we can assert things about that. Um, and so when we have problems, we just sort of have to debug at the periphery, um, sort of where that, that data is be turning into emails or that data is getting turned um, into actual pixels on the screen. Um, so in conclusion, um, yeah, I would encourage you guys to sort of think about how you're gonna test your systems um, before you build them. Um, I would also sort of encourage to, yeah, have build a way so you can kind of compare, um, that you can sort of make assertions about your data and um, especially in the case that you're building sort of like a, a client server um, interacting application that um, you would be able to sort of test, test the interaction of these two pieces because um, that's sort of where a lot of complexity happens is when you're going over the network and you have sort of two, two, two nodes trying to agree on, on state. Um, yeah, and the latter team asked me why I was going up to Seattle, and I said to uh, misrepresent all your hard work as my own. So uh, <laughs> this is really, uh, yeah, team effort, and uh, these guys put in a lot of hard work to sort of build our, our full stack frame, testing framework. Cool, all the code's up on GitHub. Um, I didn't talk too much sort of like how a lot of this is built, just sort of more of why, you know, why this is a good approach. Um, but you can kind of dig into that and um, free, feel free to uh, sort of make issues or um, comment on it. Happy to, happy to answer any questions. Cool. Thank you. Uh, any questions? Cool. Right here. Um, no. So, yeah, we run, there's no, it's all in the JVM. Um, so basically we have like our client parser.cljc file um, and we'll sort of just run that in the REPL um, and then sort of that'll get compiled and like, like put into like our app.js later but yeah there's no, no browser at all in these tests. Yeah so I've used so this is, uh, this is like the, the Vim Emacs war here. <laughs> Be careful with what I say. But I, I think, uh, and I'm, I'm not a reframe expert, um, but I would say it, it might be comparable to, the analogy that I think I've heard is um, useful is uh, if you've used uh, like Redux versus Relay. Um, like Redux is simpler, light, more lightweight, less boilerplate. Um, doesn't, is more agnostic to sort of like what you're doing with the server and like doesn't deal with any sort of client server synchronization. Whereas Relay is kind of more, um, sort of is all about sort of syncing things between client and server, but there's more overhead and more boilerplate. Um, but what you get is a lot sort of like, it'll help you sort of scale longer. Um, so I think, yeah, I think that's a similar analogy between Reframe and uh, Ohm Next. Yeah. 
Yeah, re, re, I think reframe is not as opinionated as how you get data from the server, whereas omnex says, let's use like co-located queries to do that. Cool. Awesome, thanks for coming out, guys. <laughs>